Okay, gang, here we go. We are into uh, our second lecture for the week. I uploaded the first lecture for you guys on Saturday. I just wanted to break it up. Um, it gives me a little more time to record and make sure I'm presenting the information in the correct way and read the textbook and lots going on over here. Um, so we are now getting into the ethics of research um, from the delivery side of things. So what we talked about earlier was more of the history of it. And now we're going to talk about uh, your responsibilities uh, that you, um, the conduct you should be holding or withholding or, or presenting while you are in a laboratory or you are working with a PI or you are working with a mentor and you are actually conducting research. Um, so we are going to move forward and today we're going to talk about research misconduct informed consent and the IRB. And we're going to just give you a couple examples of what some of these items are so that you are aware of them so that we are sending you into laboratories or we are sending you into uh, classrooms where you can understand what is appropriate and what is inappropriate when it comes to research. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is conflict of interest. And here is a slide talking about the basics of conflict of interest. And for new researchers, understanding these conflicts of interest is really crucial because um, if you don't understand them or if you violate these conflicts of interest, these can compromise uh, the integrity of the objectivity and the trustworthiness of your lab, your mentor, um, your PI and the research you're doing. So a conflict of interest occurs when researchers um, personal or financial or professional interests could be influenced by their study designs. Um, this happens far more often than you think it does, especially when the industry gets involved, such as pharmaceutical companies or big beverage companies such as Coca-Cola, Gatorade, uh, Pepsi, um, the UFC, uh, when you're dealing with big companies, uh, athletic companies. Uh, they they want research that is conducted surrounding their uh, their business to always be beneficial and to show positive outcomes. And at times they'll throw a lot of money at researchers that that money has to be disclosed. Uh, they'll throw a lot of clout at researchers, get them a lot of notoriety. Um, in order to kind of persuade how research results are uh, what they show. Um, so this is really, really a um, very common thing. Um, and this always leads to a biased or misleading results. And I have some examples here about some institutions. It'll just kind of blow your mind what some of these institutions are doing. Um, so we, we know that there are um, financial conflicts and financial conflicts is when a researcher receives funding um, from organizations or companies with a vested interest in the study's outcome. One of the big companies that is doing a lot of this is the milk uh, and the dairy industry. Same thing with the, you know, the meat producing industries as well. Uh, you think about things like the incredible edible egg. Um, yes, eggs are, are very, very beneficial uh, if you are eating a a diet that is uh, balanced and you're not not subscribing to the Western diet and you're eating seven eggs a day on top of, um, you know, seven strands of bacon and butter with or toast with lots of butter and, and a glass of milk with chocolate in it, right? The American breakfast. Um, but the when research is done on eggs and the egg industry is paying for that research, they always say that this thing is far, 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 far more beneficial than it is uh, detrimental. And uh, they do it within the context that everybody will benefit from it. And I'm not saying eggs are not beneficial, but I'm just saying it depends on the context that it's being presented in. Uh, somebody that is morbidly obese and suffering from severe type 2 diabetes uh, might not want to be eating eggs with the yolks. And that needs to be disclosed when research findings are are, are demonstrating that, hey, uh, you know, eggs are beneficial for everybody. So it, it's very common. Um and when the when the researchers get these um, this funding from organizations, 
these organizations want the evidence to go in their favor and this is going to be biased in the researchers results and the methods and like i said this is very 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 common um personal conflicts relationships with study participants or other researchers or organizations which might influence a researcher's objectivity happens quite a bit um and then there's professional conflicts where a researcher might have professional interest or ambitions that affect their their impartiality to what they're doing um so if they want to advance their career uh, they might tell a fib or two when it comes to conflicts of interest in their research in order to get uh, ahead of the game. And and this is to be expected in academia. Academia is is incredibly, incredibly cutthroat and com incredibly competitive. Um, so you're dealing with very, very driven, intelligent individuals um, who who want to get on top. So that is those are just some examples of um conflicts of interest. Now, there have been several historical cases where these conflicts of interest, interest uh, were violated by researchers at very, very prestigious universities. Um, and this leads to significant ethical breaches and uh, it, it impacts the public trust in academia and academia and research. Um, and if you look at my pictures here, you can see that these, some of the major universities out there um, were caught uh, basically violating these conflicts of interest. So uh, Stafford University, they had conducted um, they, they had conducted research that was here we go, just kind of highlighting it so you guys can see it. Um, they were conducting research that was f funded by the tobacco industry, and this was done through the 80s and the 90s. And um, they had several of their researchers that were that were receiving lots of money from the tobacco industry. And these researchers were publishing studies that were downplaying the health risks associated with smoking and its effect on secondhand smoke, um, which were later found to be biased due to their funding sources. So these individuals in Stafford were getting lots of money from uh, that type of industry and they were basically telling lies about how uh, how detrimental smoke is to either primary smokers or people receiving secondhand smoke so um you know very impactful research especially during that time the 80s and 90s uh, where people are like well you know maybe it's not as bad as as we believed it was and now we can smoke more because it's just not as as harmful as we once thought it was um, Harvard University did a very similar thing with the sugar industry. So good old Harvard here, and this was in the 1960s. Uh, they were funded by the Sugar Research Foundation, which is now, I believe they're known as the Sugar Association. Um, and they pu they published studies that downplayed the role of sugar in heart disease and in, in, in um, dietary health and in diabetes. And, and the funding that they received from the sugar, sugar company was never disclosed. So this violated and created a, a, a conflict of interest. Um, and then lastly, there was one more that was done at uh, Columbia University. And this was involved, they were involved in a, a conflict of interest case when an author was studying a certain epilepsy drug and they failed to disclose that they received uh, consulting fees from Pfizer, who was you know, the, the drug designer. Um, and this raised questions about the objectivity of what Pfizer was finding with this epilepsy, epilepsy drug. Um, so all of these cases kind of illustrate how these conflict of interests can undermine the credibility of academic researchers and the importance of transparency, transparency and ethical standards uh, in conducting and reporting research. So, uh, like I said, it's far, far more common than you would think it is. So because of um, this conflict of interest and the commonality of the conflict of interest, um, we are expected as researchers to provide any disclosure, full disclosure on any conflict. So when you're reading papers, you might see, unfortunately, in, in very small print at the bottom of the paper or maybe right above the abstract, uh, or maybe after the discussion section, it will say, um, you know, this research was funded by, um, you know, uh, Eli Lilly, Eli Lilly being a pharmaceutical company 
who designs drugs specifically for diabetes. And perhaps um, Eli Lilly is paying a laboratory uh, outside of their own network to conduct research, giving them a premium on that research and expecting results um, that are in favor for a drug. And, and researchers have to disclose that information. So be because of um, how common this is, there are uh, lots of monitoring that needs to be conducted by researchers. And we have to remove researchers from certain aspects of the research step um, so that they don't have full control over everything. And we do have that full disclosure. And that's where the IRB is going to come in and make sure that uh, everything we are doing is accurate and within compliance. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about research misconduct. So with research misconduct, it is very important that uh, we recognize several unethical practices that, again, very similar to these conflict of interest, will undermine the integrity and the reliability of our research. And these main types of misconducts are fabrication. And what is fabrication? That's where you make up data um, or you make up results and recordings that uh, aren't true and not real. Um, this is a, a severe violation because it creates false scientific records that misleads the scientific community and also misleads the public. This is something that is very common when it comes to PhD students who are in the lab for many, many hours, for many, many years, uh, trying to reach the finish line. And sometimes they will fabricate data, which is really, it's why it's really important for a PI to look over the data sets that uh, PhD students are generating just to make sure that the integrity hasn't been blemished. Um, it's very common. Now, we could also look and say, well, fabrication could also be statistics. This is true as well. Um, you could run multiple different types of statistics uh, for one type of test, and you can run different statistics until you get the results you want. Um, you can increase the power of, of an end size to maybe help get what you want. So there's other ways of fabricating that are uh, within the rules, uh, but you have to be you, know, you have to be mindful of that. Uh, falsification. What is falsification? This is this is manipulating research materials, equipment, processes, uh, changing or emitting data. Right. So sometimes if you have a big data set and you don't like what the outliers are doing, some researchers could punt those outliers and increase their results and get significance. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, this is not occurring and we are being as honest as possible and we are presenting incredibly accurate data. Uh, plagiarism. This is big right now because of, well, let's go back. Who's in trouble again with plagiarism? Good old Harvard University, right? We know that the president of Harvard University uh, is now in trouble and has lost her position as the president because uh, she has been um, recognized as plagiarizing uh, with some of her work as a PhD student and as a researcher. Um, so you all know what plagiarism is. This is using another person's ideas. You could, you could be using their processes, their results. Um, and their words without acknowledgement. And the reason I'm putting this one in there is because when we do our literature review, it is imperative that you find the information you want and you do not record it verbatim. Uh, we need to make sure that we are rewording and rephrasing so that we're not following uh, sentence sequences. Um, to to make a point and um, you know most of the papers that we receive that are written uh, by students we have to run through plagiarism software just to make sure that uh, we are not plagiarizing and and it's hard when you're when you're conducting a lit review because you got to think about different ways of saying the same things and that's where the creativity comes in is you know if you say uh, the sky is blue how many different ways can you creatively think about rewording that um, so that it's different that, than that original statement? And that is something that takes time to develop and you will develop that skill while we are working on our lit review. Okay, so this, this is researcher misconduct and this leads me to um, bring about another question 
which is uh, really big in, in uh, current academia, is what do we think about the use of AI? Um, you know, in my in my classes, I try not to even have students write anymore because I know more often than not they're using AI because since AI has uh, become so prevalent, uh, I have been seeing writing skills go from high school writing skills to uh, PhD writing skills in the same semester. Um, it takes an incredibly long time to learn how to write scientifically and to say what you mean and mean what you say and read your, read your papers of colorful language. So is the use of AI um, research misconduct? Well, it's uh, using AI in research is not inherently a, an example of misconduct, but it can lead to issues of fabrication. It could lead to issues of falsification and it should it could certainly lead to plagiarism if it's not uh, properly cited. Um, so if AI generated data or text is presented as original research without proper validation, um, this could be problematic. And, and using AI to generate content without proper attributions or, or, or passing off AI generated ideas as your own, this can be problematic as well. So. Um, we know that AI is a valuable tool and it has to be used ethically and transparently. Um, so if you or PhD students you know or researchers you know are using AI, uh, this could potentially lead to undermining of the integrity of their work. So just, just keep that in mind. I figured it would probably be important to um, discuss something like that. Um, so here's just a, a one more slide on research misconduct, and this is talking about institutional investigation. Um, so when a when when a researcher might be um, they might have conducted misconduct, um, this is generally first handled by the institution uh, where the research was conducting the research, and they'll do something called data auditing. So if I uh, were at UIC and I was doing research and I didn't like the results that I was getting um, and I wanted to strengthen my results by, you know, maybe getting rid of some outliers or running some different statistics. Um, by doing that, uh, I could be putting a target on myself. And uh, if, if the data sounds too good to be true, then more often than not, it is too good to be true. And with data, we, we have to provide our, our data to a review board where other, other um, researchers who are experts in the same field will do a peer review. And they'll say, yeah, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense. And they'll, they'll go through your work with a fine tooth comb. If there's something not accurate or something seems wrong, then they will have a data auditing committee where they will put your research under a microscope, pun intended, and they will ask you for all the hard copies and all the notes and everything that you've conducted to see if you are being ethical and if you are um, being honest in what you're presenting. Um, and generally in this type of um, industry, academia being an industry and research being an industry, uh, there are whistleblowers who uh, commonly, commonly do that. Because what did I say earlier? I said academia and research are very cutthroat and very competitive. Uh, so there are people out there and there are government agencies out there that will blow the whistle and put your work under a microscope. Um, and there was an example of that conducted by um, this Andrew Wakefield fella. Um, he was involved in a misconduct case. And uh, this is a really significant example of research fraud. And unfortunately, his research fraud was done in medical science, um, which was uh, the results were uh, per had a particular impact on public health. So around 1998, Andrew Wakefield, who was a British researcher, um, he published a study in The Lancet which was a very prestigious medical journal, suggesting that there was a link between measles and mumps and um, the MMR vaccine and autism. Um, and this study involved only 12 children 
and claimed that eight of them showed symptoms of autism shortly after receiving the MMR vaccine. Um, so why would something like this be so critical, especially with autism being on the rise? Um, you know, autism in 1985, it was one child every out of 10,000 that had autism. Now autism is being recognized as one child out of every 40 children. So it's much, much more prevalent now. So when you're making statements that, hey, I, I did this research and we we're looking at children that were vaccinated and out of 12 of them, eight of them developed autism, um, that's a pretty profound statement. So this statement led to uh, an investigation of, of misconduct because of how strong the statement was. Um, so this would be an example of, of falsification and fabrication. So the investigations revealed that this, this researcher had actually manipulated the evidence and falsified the data in his study. Um, and that this individual had misrepresented the medical histories of the children. He had falsified data by altering facts about the patient's conditions. Um, he conducted unnecessary invasive procedures on these children, uh, including colonoscopies and lumbar spine punctures, right, in children without proper ethical approval. So that means he did not get approval from the university and probably the IRB. Um, and this led to, this led to um, his research being audited. Um, and he, he also failed to disclose significant conflicts of interest. So, so everything he could do wrong, he did do wrong. Um, and he was providing uh, dishonest information uh, that led to him being investigated. And what were the consequences of this? Well, everything that he had, everything that he had published had been retracted. Uh, he had a medical license and that was taken away. And what did this do to uh, what did this do to society? Well, this provided a massive scare in vaccine misinformation. So the, this fraudulent study had a really profound and lasting impact on the contributing decline to vaccine rates in, in several countries, including the United States. Um, and it's still leading to outbreaks and preventable diseases such as measles and mumps. I came from California. Uh, California is quickly turning into an anti-vax state, um, and they are making claims that vaccines are leading to autism. And where did that come from? Well, that kind of initiated in in in, in this individual's research in 1998, um, and it left a really lasting impression. So, this is a really good example of how uh, when you don't follow the right procedures and you don't research, you don't present research in your findings with um, integrity and honesty, uh, this is the kind of domino effect it can have on society. And here we are in 2024, uh, and, and this is still a, a very prominent belief in society that these vaccines are associated with autism. And when you say that 8 out of 12 uh, individuals develop autism after, after vaccines, uh, that's a pretty strong statement. Okay, so now we're going to shift to what we absolutely have to do. So this is doing things right. This is providing full disclosure and full transparency to everything that's going to occur. And maybe some of you uh, are in labs now and you're working with a PI that had said, hey, before we can do anything, we have to consent the subject, right? And this is why we do this, right? We talked about all the ethical issues that happened uh, with uh, pre-World War II, during World War II, uh, the Tuskegee syphilis uh, experiments. And, um, you know, even when we fix all these things and we regulate it, we still have individual accountability with the researcher within the institution. You know, researchers have a lot of autonomy. They have a lot of freedom. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to research. So it, it's really hard to have... Uh, precise oversight to that process. So, so we have to teach integrity and honesty and transparency uh, early on so you carry that with you. Um, so in the informed consent process, uh, this is where we basically provide, let me move the slides here, um, this is where we tell the participants 
all the nece necessary information about the study, including the purpose and uh, things like the procedures and the risks and the benefits and all their rights uh, so that they can make an educated decision to whether or not they want to uh, be a part of this study. So why is this important? Well, we have to have respect for autonomy. Um, Autonomy, this respects the participants' right to make an informed decision about their involvement in the study, right? We're not fabricating, we're not falsifying, we're not hiding. We are telling them everything that is involved, whether it's invasive, whether it's non-invasive, whether their information is going to be sold to uh, perhaps the medical or pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, we have to inform them of everything we will and will not do. And this is going to provide them protection from harm. It's going to ensure these participants um, of all the potential risks and they can avoid them if they choose not to uh, experience those risks. Um, this is going to set ethical standards. It's going to uphold the ethical standards that the university would like to see, uh, that researchers should uphold. And it's going to help most importantly maintain um, trust between the researchers and the participants. Um, and there's also a little bit of a legal requirement as well. Um, uh, we want to make sure that not only are we protecting the participants and the researchers and the universities from any liability. So by being transparent, um, we kind of accomplish that task. Um, so just the hard and fast de de definition of informed consent is we have full disclosure. We have a full understanding between the parties involved. We have individuals that are uh, volunteering uh, their, uh, whether biofluids or muscle or uh, cells or information. Um, and we are demonstrating that there's, there's competence that is coming from um, the lab the university and the agreement between the lab and the individual and, and everyone is legally um, kind of protected. So there's safeguards in place. Now, one of the other major contributors to this pot process is the Institutional Review Board. Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't heard this. Like I said, I, I haven't worked with any of you and uh, none of you are doing research with me. So I have to just pretend like none of you know this and I have to make sure I'm being as thorough as possible. Um, so the IRB, what does it stand for? It stands for the Institutional Review Board. And this is a committee established to review and approve research involving human subjects. I, during my nine years at UIC doing my PhD, um, I had a very close and intimate relationship with the IRB. And then when I did my master's, I also had a very uh, close and intimate relationship with the IRB in California. Um, so uh, I, I know this committee very well. And since most of my research is in humans and we are extracting tissue such as muscle, um, we are under a microscope with the IRB. Um, what's its primary purpose? Well, its primary purpose is to ensure that the research and the lab and the PI and the PhD students and the university all adhere to ethical standards, right? So where was this in pre-World War II or during World War II or during the Tuskegee experiments? Nowhere to be found. Um, <clears throat> and um, we want to make sure that the, the participants have rights and their welfare is protected. So why, why is this important? Well, it's important because the IRB provides that ethical insight that we absolutely must have. It ensures that the research is done ethically and it safeguards the participant. Okay. Very, very important, very necessary. It makes sure that we have an informed consent and that informed consent is uh, transparent and it is honest. And the IRB must review your informed consent process and your wording and everything. Uh, they will nitpick every single word, article, conjunction, preposition, prepositional phrase, gerund, noun, adjective. They will go through it and they will pick it apart, which is frustrating. But at the end of the day, it's to protect all parties involved. So it's necessary. Um, and they want to make sure that that wording um, explains all of the risks and the benefits to the participant. So if any wording 
is confusing. We have this third party kind of watchdog, right? This IRB that says, nope, restate this. This doesn't make sense. And one of the things the IRB will do is they will make sure that what you write is at a certain reading level. Um, they want to make sure that individuals that might not be as educated as PhDs and master level students can read and understand what is being what is being explained on the informed consent. So they will make sure that if something is too complicated, you have to simplify it. And that is that is another uh, that's another skill set you have to learn is how to simplify your language in order to provide as accurate uh, details as you possibly can to somebody who might have a lower reading level. Um, and it also makes sure that everyone is in compliance, right? So it ensures that the researcher complies with the federal regulations and most importantly, the institution's responsibilities. Um, so I'm just going to go here and just kind of, you, you can read this. I'm telling very long winded stories. Um, so most importantly, um, they review the protocols, they assess the informate, the informed consent, and they monitor the ongoing research. So if you have a research project that is going for, let's say one of the ones that we were doing in our lab was about four years. Every year we had to revise IR, IRB and update it. So they're constantly, constantly making sure that everybody is adhering to the original plan. And here is the application um, process. You know, you, you I kind of told you these things already. Um, and you got to make sure that you answer these questions, right? So at the end of the day, some of you might have already worked with the RERB. Some of you may not have. Some of you may be very familiar with it. Some of you might be like, okay, okay, I heard it, but I didn't really know what they did. Well, they are the watchdog. They are making sure that everyone is being honest. Everybody is being transparent. If there's any funding, it needs to be labeled that the, the funding is uh, provided by a, a, B, or C company, and that has to be disclosed. The, uh, the risk to benefits, the surveys, the questionnaires, the consent forms, anything you do or you provide with a part to a participant has to be uh, evaluated by the IRB. So if you're only doing surveys, let's say you're not even doing non-invasive research, um, you have to present the surveys to the IRB so they can look over them. And again, this is just for human research. If you're doing laboratory, uh, if you're doing rodent or murin models, um, where you're, you're sacking mice and, um, dissecting them, you don't have to provide any information to the IRB. Um, so, and there's, there's three major types of reviews that, uh, the IRB usually does, which is an exempt review, an expedited review, or a full board review, uh, because the labs that, that I worked in here, um, because we did muscle biopsies and we were doing uh, small intestine and large intestinal biopsies, um, sometimes even doing liver biopsies, um, we had to have a full review because of the how invasive the research was. So um, when we're talking about exempt reviews, this is like research activities that are that just present minimal risk to participants. Um, so these could be questionnaires. Um, these are things where the surveys or educational studies or public behavior observations, um, you don't really need to pro provide an IRB review simply because you're not doing anything invasively that is causing any sort of major risk. And then as we move up to the green, uh, I'm sorry, the, from green to yellow, an expedited review just means that there might be a minimal risk that is involved, right? So this could be collecting body fluids such as urine or feces or saliva or blood, um, psychological surveys. Um, this is going to re require a review of some degree because now you're getting invasive with the subject. Um, and then lastly, the full review, review um, this is for research that is involving more than minimal risk. So for example, when you're doing a muscle biopsy or uh, the lab that I was in, we were doing something called a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, where we would lay somebody on the bed for two hours and we would infuse insulin and glucose uh, simultaneously to see what the glucose disposal rate was in their body. So when you're doing something like that, that is very high risk research. Um, and when you're doing that with, when you're doing that to somebody with type two diabetes, we have to do it in a hospital where we have doctors nearby just in case something goes wrong. Um, this is also um, 
really, really important for vulnerable populations, right? We talked about that early on with ethics. So if we're doing research on children or pregnant women or prisoners, um, we have to have a full board review because of our dark history with research and what we did to those populations in the past. Um, so that is all I have for you on the ethics. And I just wanted to get this up for you guys. So you had it. And now you have a bit of a comprehensive understanding of research and ethics. And we talked about the different types of research and qualitative and quantitative and, and uh, primary and secondary. And now I think with this kind of background and what we're going to talk about with the librarian uh, for the review session, uh, I think we're pretty good to start moving forward with a bit more of the difficult content um, and start preparing for our lit reviews. So I will be in touch very soon. I hope you all have a wonderful day and take care of each other.